everybody. Welcome to Gathering of the Minds. Well, if we have two roads that we could go on, either banning it or not banning it, uh, Bill, I'd be interested in what you think. And also, uh, Styx, you've had a big experience with this as well, as far as uh, being able to talk with some of uh, some of these kinds of people. Where do you think the road would lead if we do outright ban and censor things that are as horrible as we can ever imagine? Well, when Lev and I were getting dinner, he used a really good word for it, which was fermentation of bad ideas happens when you ban them, generally speaking. That, okay, you ban them from the mainstream, you sort of out of sight, out of mind, but where, where they go, they're not going away. They're actually going to find their own little rat hole on the internet and just fester and, and do their thing. So, you know, useful speech is different from free speech, I think, and, you know, social consensus on you know, what is useful, that, that's different from the law. When, I think one important thing about free speech is uh, when I see these deep platformings, you know, uh, recently Sargon of Akkad, who was a YouTuber, had a bunch of anti-fascist protesters come in and shut the event down. When you shut the events down and you don't allow these people to speak, they will find the little red corner of the internet, they will find the little hole somewhere in the wall, and there will be no one to challenge them. And that means when they, when they do convince someone to come in and sit down and hear what they have to say, they're only going to hear good things. And that person's gonna be like, wow, all of this makes sense and I believe it. When you create an open forum with real debate, you can have someone say, here's why they're wrong and I can prove it, and that creates useful speech. Nope. Eleanor, what do you think? Uh, there's so many thoughts going around my head right now. Um, where to start? I think that uh, it, it, prohibition has never um, helped the US. I mean, you can look at anything, it's something as, as seemingly trivial compared to the rise of fascism as, uh, as pro uh, prohibition of alcohol. Um, and that led to the mafia, and it led to you know the, the uh, installation of gangs in a lot of major cities. But I think uh, instead of looking at it like it's just sort of like this black and white situation, I think it also helps to ask the question. And I don't pretend to have the answer to this, but also to ask the question like, what do we want our social media platforms to be? Do we want them to be an exact representation of like a street corner where anybody can go and say anything that they want? Because I think it's important to note that. Social media platforms are not, they're, they, they don't have the same restrictions or freedoms that a street corner does. So, for example, uh, in the book, uh, Corporations Are Not People, the author talks about like how uh, Philip Morris argued that, oh, well, a, a smoking ad is just like a, a it, it's not, it, it's just like free speech. It's just like a person standing on the street corner telling people that he really enjoys smoking. But that's not true. Uh, because that's not subject to somebody walking up to that person and saying, hey, this is really messed up that you feel this way, let's, you know, talk about it. A social media platform, as I'm sure most, a lot of you could attest to, it doesn't have that real life feeling. I mean, I get trolled so often on social media, but I get trolled so infrequently in real life because you have this freedom to be horrible online that a lot of people don't take that freedom offline. That's not to say that I think that everybody who trolls me should be banned from the internet, that would be absurd. But I think that we should take things like threats and we should take things like calls to genocide entire peoples. I think we should take that very seriously and ask ourselves, what do we want our social media platforms to be? And particularly like in this, in this moment of the, the rise of anti-intellectualism, the rise of these far right extremist groups, uh, do we want our social media platforms to be open to them. I, and I'm not saying I have the answer. I think it's a very difficult question to grapple with. But I think it's worth contemplating, like, how do we want our social media platforms to look in regards to how free speech looks in the real world? And ask that question, like, just because these people have free speech, you know, in the real world, does that mean that we have to be the platform for them? Because free speech, for example, doesn't apply if somebody walks into my apartment and starts shrieking at me. That's not free speech. But outside on the sidewalk, that's free speech. I think it's that sort of question that needs to be grappled with in terms of the, the online experience. We can <clears throat> divide this up into different issues. First of all, we, we can talk about in terms of uh, you know, protocol. Obviously, it's social media, which is so it's almost an oxymoron because we think about what you can and can't say. But obviously, you, you shouldn't be able to, to abuse people. That's not what we're talking about. There's got to be some kind of something. Here, for example, you got to wear a jacket. No, no shirt, no shoes, no service. We're used to that. 
The issue is that when Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is, as seemingly eh, innocent and cute as they are, but people who, for example, just spend their days taking pictures of their sleeping dogs or whatever it is, this happens to be the source of news for 90% of America. Now, all of a sudden, this little cute little social media turns into a utility, in my view. It's bigger than anything. This is where people get their news. Now, it's one thing to say, you can't curse, you can't pose child pornography. Yeah, we know that. But if all of a sudden you're posting something or you're finding that you're not getting the news that you thought you should be because Facebook or whatever are throttling or shutting it up, that's a different issue. Very quickly, 25, 30 years ago, there was an idea called hate crimes. And hate crimes, we love the idea, which to be is oxymoron. I don't know about love crimes or something. Means, but anyway, but years ago, there was a thing called hate crimes. It was the idea of taking something that is already cognizable at law, let's say battery, hitting somebody is against the law. But if I take why you hit somebody, why? Because you don't like Alsatians, or you don't like uh, black people, right? And I take that and I pair a constitutionally protected idea of hate, because you can hate all you want, just don't act on it. All of a sudden, I'm now elevating, I'm penalizing somebody for what they thought. I'm also making it difficult for the prosecutor because now I've got to prove, in addition to intent, why you did so. It was a mess. Horrible. Every prosecutor hated that. But society loved it. And with that came the idea of confusing that which we as a society hate, loathe and eschew, and, 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 and what, what you get rid of in terms of hate and genocide and all that, with governmental or quasi governmental banning of the ability, and what falls under the category of hate. What does that mean? Once you okay a limitation, I'm going to get around it. And I'm going to limit your speech by using your rule, which you started with the, the greatest of intention. I missed the beginning. Who are you? Um, yeah, I guess like one thing that I really feel strongly is that there's no such thing as a neutral platform, just as there's no such thing as objective journalism. So I think just by creating an interface and design and a way that people, you know, interact with content, you're already making so many choices about, about how people, you know, what information they're getting. I mean, even the fact that we get our information in rectangles rather than circles or bubbles is, is a choice that formats our thinking in a certain way. You know, so um, so I think that. People who you know run these types of platforms like Minds need to be thinking in the, in the fact that they're already creating a, a medium that has a perspective. Uh, there isn't really such a thing as neutrality or objectivity, as quantum physics tells us, and so on. I, I saw you put your thumbs down. Yeah, most I, uh, I'm Tim Paul, I'm a journalist. Okay, cool. <laughs> what do you write uh, I am a video journalist, so okay. I uh, work for Vice for Fusion. Oh, cool. no, okay. um, I don't want to get too much into it, but there is objective journalism. And people often yeah, confuse. Sorry, but how could there be a objective with objective anything? Because you're confusing omniscience with objectivity, right? Mm -hmm. so, so I'll give you an example. If I was to report on what you know two people in the back of the room were doing, I don't know any of them, and I would say guy A threw a piece of paper at guy B. I'm objectively telling you what I saw that happened. A guy threw something, right? Well, I mean that's what you're choosing to isolate of everything else that's happening. Well, so 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 certainly if if there's two guys in the street and I'm standing across the street and someone punches the other guy, I can tell you objectively that guy punched that guy. Yeah, but that's what you're choosing objectively. If someone asked me what happened, if, yeah. someone, if someone said what happened, I'd say that guy punched yeah, that guy. You might also say that right. there was like this newspaper blowing in the gutter. You know, and, and, and so, the choice of the internet right. so things. Objectivity. To say that something is important. So that's objectivity and reporting. Decision. See, that's that we're, not, we're talking, you're arguing omniscience, mm -hmm. right? Obviously, mm -hmm. I'm not going to stand in a street corner and just know everything. But if I'm in a place and I'm looking at a group of people and I see someone do something and someone asks me what I saw, mm -hmm. I can objectively say, I don't know what those people are. Now, if one of those people happen to be like a friend of mine, that's not objective. So there's a difference there. But I, I, I don't want to get too much in this because I'm not on a journalism panel. But I do want to mention one interesting thing you brought up that I think Bill absolutely needs to pay attention to is that if, if it is true that the right is targeted more by censorship on these platforms, which I'm not saying it is, then the, at least the perception is among the right. So what happens is they flock to alternative platforms. You, you then, uh, as, as you were just saying, the platforms aren't neutral, not in the sense that they can't be, but you're going to get more of one kind of person coming to your platform, and then how do you prevent that platform from just, from just being a platform for their politics? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, censorship is happening to both the right and left. It seems a little bit more tipped towards the right, but I mean, LGBTQ, Wired did a really interesting piece about LGBTQ censorship. 
on Facebook for you know whatever it is, nipples, certain language. So it, it's affecting the whole spectrum. But I mean, yeah, it, uh, I think as long as we're guiding the conversation to where to this, that's that is not pure neutrality. We're we're having this conversation. We're we're not just letting it happen without talking about it. That's a huge conundrum because I, 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 I'm sure YouTube would say we're guiding the conversation. We want to make sure the racists start, you know, flourishing. It's a challenge. I guess the, the question is like, how do you guide the conversation without creating the sort of filter bubbles that Facebook has created where like, if I'm, you know, if I Google something and you Google the same exact thing, we'll get two different results. We'll get two different pages of results. And it's the same thing if I log on to Facebook and I have, and Facebook knows that I predominantly look at, uh, you know, environmental justice pages, it'll show me those predominantly. But even if my mom follows the same pages, but she's more interested in, in dancing, but she'll see the dancing. So it's like, how do you guide the conversation without restricting it and, and creating these sort of filter bubbles that are basically just echo chambers? Well, that's why the chronological unrestricted newsfeed is essential. By default, I mean that is actually an example of technical neutrality that is really important, so as not to create those bubbles and let people continue to reach their audiences on Facebook and Google. You know, you're reaching three percent organically now. So, but do you think people will automatically start filtering certain things out of their feed that they don't want to see and go back into those uh, bubbles? Like, who breaks the bubble? There's, so we like, well, you can opt out of Boost if you want. I mean, ultimately, look, you're going to create your experience and we think users... Can you say a little bit about Boost just so everybody knows? Users deserve to control what they're seeing. I mean, just having algorithms dictate your daily flow of information is ridiculous. Like, you should subscribe if you want to subscribe to them and subscribe from them if you don't want to see them. Um, boost is a system where you can boost your posts based on uh, your... The, amount of currency that you have and you can get more views on it and who show up every once in a while on your feed and that's sort of how the network is driven. But um, you know, you don't know what those boosts are gonna be, so that's a good bubble popper. Mm. And then, you know, the other tools are just listening to conversations, trying to subscribe to people you disagree with. I don't know, you have to there comes a point where education matters. You have to educate yourself. Phil, here's a question for you. What would be a way that you could create metrics around whether Minds was having a positive or negative impact on people's capacity for research? Uh, maybe, maybe we could run a secret experiment like uh, Facebook <laughs> did, where yeah. they measured people's moods and they injected either happy or sad content and then looked at their posts and reactions. And yeah, they figured out that they could dictate people's happiness levels. And it was so now experiments like that. You're jumping into a negative, but I'm trying no, to but, but, no, I know. Potentially, that could be positive, but it would have to be totally by the consent of the user, obviously. Mm -hmm. And all of the data would have to be totally public. So you would, I mean, it could happen in a transparent way, I guess. I'm also wondering if there's a way, because I, I feel like one of the things that gets lost on social media is the ability to change your mind, or, the, or even like being asked to change your mind that's not also coupled with the death threat. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if there's a way for a place of minds to say like, hey, this is, you know, like on Facebook, we have like the, the, the ridiculous like recommended for you. Um, but if there was an actual way to make a recommended for you that was outside of the purview of your typical pages that you follow, and it was like, so like I might get something that was uh, more like not as, as left as I am on the political spectrum and I could read it and be like, oh, that has some interesting points. And that way I'm going to it. I'm not getting it thrown in my face by someone who's angry, uh, and yet at the same time, that's a, a way to get outside of the filter bubble. Um, yeah, that's a good, good suggestion. Sticks, as far as getting people out of their bubbles, that's one thing I would like to ask you, but also uh, the conversation about uh, talking with uh, people who most people would not approve of that much, and how that actually. Uh, stops uh, the fermentation that uh, Bill was referring to me referring to before when we were having dinner. Well, those two things really go hand in hand because the best way, if you're talking about social media, whether it's YouTube, Facebook, whatever, I think, this is just my feeling, the best way to challenge someone's echo chamber to prevent them from becoming you know, too fanatic, maybe they get violent, or they're just, they just remain ignorant of reality, perhaps, is to challenge their views by not creating an echo chamber in the public space in the first place. I think the biggest problem that we're seeing emerge on YouTube 
isn't even so much the, you know the rules as the the discerning behavior of the moderation staff and the algorithms i think what's happened is that they're confusing vagary uh, with the ability to just uh, use a little bit of discretion in how they apply the rules so we've got limited state limited state is applied to a video that does not actually break the rules but it comes close to breaking the rules the final decision on whether your video should go in that category is made by a perfectly fallible, potentially biased human being. I think that the biggest problem is if you're you're worried about extremists, you're worried about fanatics, zealots, whatever, those people, you're worried fundamentally about them having an extreme bias. How do you then fix for the fact that some of the people policing that behavior may themselves have similar degrees of bias? I think that's becoming a big problem. Uh, I think Facebook is becoming irrelevant at this point, so I'm not sure why even bother talking about it. It's dying as a platform. None of the, the new kids, so to speak, use it. People from my generation, of course, we're, we're gravitating away. We're using Mines or Gab or something like that. Nobody cares about Zuckerberg's synth experiments anymore in the Institute. Uh, but definitely, you've gotten to the point where you've got people being chased into echo chambers and you can go to them. But I think people should be able to go to an extremist echo chamber as long as they're not like plotting terrorism or something. But in the public forum, as long as you have a company, uh, I, I understand uh, what's being said here uh, in the sense of a company or a, a site cannot be fully unbiased. I would acknowledge that that's the case. Therefore, their bias should be towards, hey, we're going to take a hands-off approach and let the user base actually sort of decide how things go as far as news goes. Challenging people's echo chamber is great, but at the same time, if they don't want to be challenged, ultimately, there's not a whole lot you can do other than, than uh, put material out there that's interesting, hopefully, and smart, uh, that's been uh, independently produced that can actually get that accomplished. Because a company, companies are totally inept when it comes to marketing, I think, things like that. Thank you.